think is really the impact that we see the most um, is when you make investments, um, businesses locate here, they expand here, they're able to move their products better. Um, and that's a very real impact that really shows the value of this. And we've even seen businesses willing to contribute their own money <coughs> to transportation projects. So if you look at Brenda Road Project in Minnetonka, there was a contribution from United um, there are other businesses that are willing to kick in their own money to get an interchange built or get an, an intersection fixed because that's how important it is to their business. But there are businesses who say, don't do this because it's going to raise my cost of doing business. Sure. Right? And so I'm just, I'm just sure. thinking, how do you talk to those people? I would really delve into the details of that I test the return because I think there's a ton of good data there that speaks to what the tangible returns are. It speaks from the human resource perspective of People, the employees want to locate and work for companies where they have these options. Maybe tying a couple threads together here, too, with the transit side, Dallas and Salt Lake, which are arguably in as conservative of an environment as anywhere in the country, are way out ahead of us in the transit investment. So they're betting on it being a smart economic investment. Getting down to the fine grain of each business's return, that's kind of your individual calculus. But overall, this is a very smart investment for our region. Getting to the bottom line question, um, if what what we what we know, what we've heard is is more anecdotal than than heavy duty um, research. But there there are anecdotes about you know the businesses will have you know, costs that go go to the bottom line if it affects the rates. But by the same token, if Congestion is eased through the corridors that, that a trucking company runs it, its, its vehicles. They don't have to run as many vehicles. Uh, Trying to get product to, uh, through the Twin Cities to the airport at, at a particular time means that you don't have to run as many trucks. If you don't run as many trucks, you don't have as, you don't need as many drivers. You can start reducing the costs on the other side of the ledger, and and. Those stories are, are more anecdotal, but we, we have been hearing those. Do you have people that will support you at the legislature telling that story? And I've done the analysis. I, I'll, I'll save this much more, so I support it. You know, some businesses that, because this is, the, I think, the challenge is the legislators who maybe kind of see things in a very simple slice, because they've got, you know, so many issues they have to deal with. Uh, and and MnDOT Commissioner um, Sally has, has been talking to a number of businesses collecting those kinds of stories, the, the problem for us is that they're unwilling to step out in front and, and say that, and, and there are political reasons why. But um, you know, we, those stories are being collected at, at this point, and, and the commissioner has been doing a fairly good job of making it that real to, to business. And I would say there are more um, agricultural interests um, that have to move products who are more very willing to go out, come out and say, this is costing me a lot of money. I would also say the Texas Transportation Institute has done a very thorough analysis of the cost of congestion every year in metropolitan areas. They do have a methodology that's recognized around the country for what it costs in fuel and lost time for being stuck in congestion. So, you know, like you said, there's a very real cost if we don't fix these problems. Back in the 2008 discussion, and, and actually back in the MBES campaign, Sex. One of the anecdotes that, that was used was, was a, a, from Medtronic, and, and they're concerned that if they're trying to get you know, product, you know, pacemakers to the airport for surgery the next day, they really have to pay attention to how, how that, that they can get that uh, through the system and down to the airport. And it, you know, it turns into people's lives in addition to just dollars and cents. That's the kind of story that we need. That's who we need. And, and we need the Medtronics to bring that story forward, and, and we're trying to work, work in that, that direction. I mean, see, we, we share that pain because two years ago when we were working on the, the quarter cent or the half cent, whatever the, um, we, we had board members who said, oh, well, this is a real issue for me, but I, I can't possibly testify because I need the uh, Republicans on these other issues, so if I don't want to upset them on this issue, which I know is a firebrand for them or a red flag. So we couldn't get them to the to the microphone. I'm not sure what will happen if, if all a business gets on board 
going into 2015, then that, that could be a different story. Maybe there'll be a lineup of people wanting to do it. Uh, we should be so lucky. Yes, sir. The, did I hear right? The chamber presently supports a half cent, going back to the transit. Half cent. We supported a half cent the last time it came up. We did not support, it didn't happen in 14, it was in 13. Will that be revisited, the possibility of supporting at the three quarter cent level? I think we're going to look at my uh, bosses. I think we're going to revisit all of it in the next several months and try to be in a position to uh, provide value at the end of the year and early into January. That's the same situation with the St. Paul Chamber. The Minnesota Chamber expects after the election to come out with, with their view as well. And behind the scenes, we're working as hard as we can to make that a view. Uh, we've met privately uh, with the Minnesota Chamber. We meet with the St. Paul Chamber all the time. We've certainly talked with this group behind the scenes as well, and Darren. And, and we're trying to come with one big, powerful voice. But none of the chambers are part of Move Minnesota right now. Fair. That's fair. And then a follow-up. The $335 million annually, will that fund all of the present projects that are on the proposal for the regional expansion that are listed? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And will that fund them also in terms of operating, or is there going to also be an increase in general fund dollars needed after the, the build-out is done? That would fund capital and operating. And again, what I think I said earlier is that we can't predict with certainty that the feds are going to be there and cash the capital costs on these very large projects. We've had great success, and we're very optimistic about green line extension, blue line extension, but some of that, you know, but that's why at three quarters cent, we can tell you that we can build this system in you know, 15 years, more or less, uh, with that funding source. And build out. And build out the bus, and have a 10% of that money to go to the bike pipe connection. A number of us met with Transportation Secretary Fox when he was here, and he told us point blank, he goes, get in now because I cannot, I don't see that we're going to stay at this 50%. It used to be 80%. It's gone to 50, so go take it down to 40, down to 30, you take Southwest Corridor, where the feds are in for 800 million, and you take... 10 or 15 percent of that away, not the real money. <laughs> yeah. Others, nobody is asking about, I want you guys to beat them up on this wholesale fuel tax. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> there. I don't want to think of any of the conversation, but, I, but this is very helpful to me because this whole, the topic of transportation funding is complicated. So on the, on the wholesale fuel tax, I know that's been uh, kind of a lightning rod, and you mentioned that we already have a sales tax. So maybe you could kind of walk me through it. I understand we have a gas tax, and it's a fixed amount. And the concern with the sales tax is it's not transparent. But you mentioned, well, it's already kind of how it's done, and you translate it to a gas tax number, and it's at the pump. So I'm just trying to understand what the, what the concern is with the transparency versus it actually shows up just the same as any cents per gallon on the, at the pump price. Well, that's my question, too. I don't understand the concern, but um, I guess I would just say, think about it this way. It's not, it gets talked about as a wholesale tax. Yeah. It's, it, we already have a wholesale tax on fuel. <laughs> so I, we need to kind of change it from the difference that we're talking about is going from a per gallon tax to a percentage of the price tax. That's the change we're talking about. The wholesale issue is moot. We already do this at the wholesale. So the difference is a per gallon tax is totally dependent on consumption, whereas a sales tax, which is a percentage of the price, naturally increases as the price goes up. And sometimes it'll go down, and that happens too. It'll, it'll have more fluctuation. But the overall trend over the last 20 years has definitely been for fuel prices to increase. So, so that's maybe the difference. Maybe I could ask Richard somebody, yeah, what well, is the concern with transparency? I mean, if it's if it's twenty eight cents per gallon, it's it's transparent. If it's five percent, well, I think because it has been the issue. I think yeah, I think so too. First of all, I don't think you know you can find very many consumers who can tell you what the uh, gas tax per gallon is. Okay, you is know, it, what think, is it? I think we suffer. It's twenty eight cents at the state level and eighteen point four and eighteen point four at the federal. Level. Um, so I think, first of all, we, we suffer from the fact that we haven't done a very good job forever in making it apparent what the tax is on fuel. 
I mean, if you're a consumer and you pull up to that gas pump, I can't remember, I think there was a time when you could find a little sticker in very tiny print that was on every pump that told you what the state and federal fuel tax is. I don't think it's there anymore, is it? So we don't. I think it's our eyes, Rich. Yeah, maybe that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was thirty-five cents, three dollars and fifty cents. But but I think we suffer from the fact that we've never been very transparent with consumers about what they pay in the way of fuel tax, um, and so there's a part of me that says if we want to switch to sales tax. Why don't we just do a retail sales tax? And retail, I, right? Right yeah. there at the pump. Well, it's I can like. Tell you <laughs> Because we want the money to be dedicated. And the Minnesota Constitution has language that talks about an excise tax on fuel or a tax on the business of selling it has to be deposited in the highway user tax distribution fund. So the way the legislation was structured last session, um, this was treated as a gross receipts tax, which is a tax on the sale of fuel. And as long as it's structured that way, um, it meets the constitutional language that it has to go to the highway user tax distribution fund. That's why we don't want it to be a retail that's collected by the gas station owners, but instead collected from the fuel distributors. The other but reason, of, though, is, is that uh, by collecting it at the wholesale level, there's only a, a limited number of points exactly. of collection, and so it's, it's probably you know, one of, if not the most efficient tax that you could, that, that you know all of our taxes to collect because it costs so little to collect it. Uh, whereas if you know we collected it at each individual retail, that just the collection process would eat up a larger share of the of the receipts. If you guys translate it, kind of get back to what Jim was saying into the real world examples, so for me as an individual consumer, it's going to go from you know, forty six cents per gallon to how much? Well, depending on the price, it could be anywhere from 10 to 12 cents a gallon. And yes, we have done sort of the real, real world, you know, what is the average miles per gallon per vehicle, and what is the average person drive. And it's about, oh, what did we come up with, $2 a week? Um, so, for, you know, for the cost, and Commissioner Zelli did a great job of kind of talking about this around the state. So, like, for the cost of a cup of coffee at Starbucks or for the cost of a beer a week, you know, you can have better roads, and, and, you know, that's kind of what it translates into. The other problem we suffer from with the public is not just not knowing what the tax is, but they have no concept of what it costs them. So they don't do the math. They're, people vary wide, wildly in what they think they're paying in taxes, um, but a five-cent increase in the fuel tax costs the average driver $50 a year. So this is not a big burden on people that we're talking about. But it does make a huge difference for the transportation system. Here's, here's the, the sense of transparency. In 2008, we passed an eight cent thing, increase in the eight, eight cents. And the consumer said, I'm going to pay eight cents more. Yep. It went up from 20 and a half to 28 cents yep. over, over in phase 10. Yep. So the wholesale fuels tax, we're not saying it's a 12 cent tax or 13 well, cent it tax. Will. We're saying it's a 5% wholesale fuel tax. Oh, OK, 5%. I have no idea what that means. So yeah, well, but yes, they do. I mean, they're not stupid. Five percent or eight cents. I, I don't get the transparency either. I, I just, how can you say that they don't understand this five percent? I think we don't know what. No idea. They're going to do that part. Right. right. That part it, is, it is tricky. They don't want to support it in the first place, and they're <laughs> just moving the bar around to make excuses. Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> but Bill, you said you know what? Wholesale fuel tax is going at five percent. The person is not going to calculate, well, that's 12 and a half cents of a new gas tax cost to me. They're not going to know 5% of what? 5% of the wholesale fuel? What is the, what is the wholesale pay versus what do I pay? They're just not going to go there. And we've never talked, even if it was collected at the wholesale level, we always talk in terms of pennies at the pump. Yeah. And so, we will continue well, but, to, because right, again, right. if you look at the, the explanation of the mechanism of how this is going to be collected, the Department of Revenue will literally adjust the cents per gallon. Right. Amount right. once a year, so people will know how, what that translates into in a cents per gallon <coughs> amount. So it will be just like raising the cents per gallon tax. But that's what we should come into the legislature with and say, why do on a wholesale level it's a 16% gas tax increase mm -hmm. or whatever it is? That's right. where some of us have. Right. 
program, because this doesn't say that. So but just to follow up on it, because that's a good point, Todd. So it, it, I mean, they talk about a wholesale gas tax. What does that mean? It's, it, I mean, one thing is collected at the wholesale level. A, a second, maybe related, maybe the same thing or the same point. It's 5% of the wholesale cost. But I, I, is it the wholesale cost or the retail cost? So the wholesale cost. The conversion. <laughs> but if I can just like, this is again very helpful to me. So um, you mentioned like maybe 12 cents additional. Is that on top of the 28 cents? Yes. Yeah. So if you put those two together and just say what, just in today's prices, that's about 11% of the actual pump price, that's right? Good. Just about there. So that's another way. You know, how do you talk about And this? I'm sure, like, Laura, everyone is going to do that. No, I know. But the, as we do all this, then it's right. like, well, what makes sense to people? What's understandable? No, that's a really good point. And actually, the percentage of the price that people pay at the pump in taxes has gone down dramatically over the years. I mean, when you think about what the price that right. used to be and how much of that you see a third of the price of what you paid at the pump was taxes. Now we're down to about 11%. Um, most of what you pay at the pump is going to the fuel people. It's not going to pay taxes. But I think all of this retail becomes moot if we can get to the end user, the consumer, who yeah. says, this is only $15 a year car. to me. Yeah. Right. I don't care about the transparency right. or full right. sale discussion here. This right. It is done. Right. So, Jay, just getting to the psychology of, of the gas tax thing, yeah. something that Rich brought up. You know. So when I, was, when I was in college and I was driving around, it was 25.9 cents. And, and if that's in your head, then, you know, there's always going to be this barrier, but you can go to like uh, TwinCitiesGasPrices.com today. You can bring up the, the, the cost for the Twin Cities, and they'll list out the top, mm -hmm. you know, the top 25 um, uh, retail sellers and, and you know where you can get the cheapest gas. And then, they, interestingly, they'll all show you where the highest prices are. You take the top 10 of with the lowest prices, we take the top 10 of the bottom prices on the same grade of gas, on the same grade of gas, yeah. regular gas. And there's usually 20 to 30 cents spread just in the, in the, in the metro region on the price of gas. So a 10 cent, the equivalent of a 10 cent a gallon gas tax is lost in the market. It's, it's, it's noise in the market right now. The, the difference between regular gas and mid-grade gas is 10 to 15 cents a gallon. Between regular and premium, it's 20 to 30 cents a gallon. It, it gets lost in, in the consumer choice of where you go and where, where you buy gas. So the psychology is we're locked into what we, what we bought, you know, or what we thought we were paying for back when we started driving. But the, the economics of this are, are, are you know, completely different. <coughs> well, TFAC recommended a 40 cent in the gas tax over, over, over 20 years. <clears throat> so any media in here? Yes. Our friends in the media said, Chief Act recommends 40, 40 cent gas tax increase. Everybody said, 40 cents? My God, that's, that's horrible. And it was over 20 years. Jeff, you haven't spoken yet. So I'm just thinking about this from a, from a business term, the way I would look at it, or a nonprofit, and that so much of the time I've said in so many meetings and deal with this day in and day out where you know there's a line item in the financial statements called depreciation. And many companies, at the end of the day, they get back to the income, and then they add back depreciation. They say, hey, this is our cash flow. And I said, no, 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 depreciation is not a cash event, but it's a real event. And that you have to fund that depreciation, or you're going to be dealing with deferred maintenance, which is now going to call a capital call, which this whole conversation to me is about a capital call yep. I'm in the real estate business. So what happens to that line item depreciation? Is it such that somebody needs to be addressing that item to say in the future, depreciation on our bridges and roaches? Roads has to be truly funded into an account every year, so we don't have deferred maintenance. Is that what's going on too? Well, there's been more discussion of that. I think there's been more recognition of the fact that there is both an operations cost to building roads. They have to be plowed, they have to be striped, they have to be maintained, they have to be clean, um, and also that down the road they have to be rebuilt. And it isn't necessarily um, built in, so to speak. Um, but there is more of a recognition, and also on the transit side. Transit systems don't last forever either. You know, you have to replace buses, you have to replace trains, you have to replace tracks. You know, all of that is real, but do people say at the front end, we're going to add that into the cost of this project? No. Um, 
um, I think there's more of a recognition that those costs will be there down the road. Um, but no, there, there isn't that fine-tuned of a, an analysis that goes into it. Most of the time, we're just struggling to come up with the construction cost, and there's kind of an assumption that the operations and maintenance money will be there. Um, but a lot of times what does happen um, is that money gets moved around. Um, and, and that's been enough of an issue that the FTA has sort of said, you know, if you're going to build rail, you can't steal from the bus system to pay for it. <clears throat> because that tends to be a, a natural reaction. So, yeah, and not a good idea. So, so that is a very real cost, and I think government struggle with, with how to deal with that. I remember Congressman Overstar talking for many years that the government should deal with infrastructure as a capital budget piece separately from a lot of the other functions that government pays for that are more operations that are ongoing costs that we should recognize that there are capital costs and there are operational costs. But the government doesn't really deal with it that we're the chamber, we're gonna end on time. This group, and Darren in the back, have been taking the slings and arrows, leading this charge for transit and transportation. Whether you agree with everything they think, or all of it, they are really moving it forward and pushing the envelope and pulling this conversation along and doing so very, very credibly. So please help me thank them.